Well, we're going to continue on the Sermon on the Mount lesson this morning. Uh, Open up to Luke 16, put a marker in Matthew 5, that's where we'll be going next. Uh, (laughs) Confession time. I'm I'm having a great, I don't know if anybody else is having a great time going through the Sermon on the Mount. So you see me standing here, but I'm already dancing on the inside. And what I'm seeing, the Sermon on the Mount is really like Salvation 101 for kingdom people. This is, this is the first things, the very first, it's kind of like our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. You know, there's many things in that Constitution, but the Declaration is first. And there's some principles in there that are the foundation that everything else rests on. You know, God has given us certain inalienable rights. See, that's a, that's a principle. Well, it's kind of like that in the Sermon on the Mount. Everything hinges on this. this. These are the principles. This is God's nature. This is really who you are in Christ right here. And everything else builds on this. And what's sad is I had to pray and meditate and fast a little bit <laughs> for over 20 years to get to the place where I can even understand it. My goodness. The good news about that is we are where we can understand it. We're finally getting to the place where I think we can truly seek first the kingdom and understand really what that means. Once you, what happens, what's happening to me is I want to go back and redo every teaching I've ever done. And it's not that they're, it's not that they're wrong really, but they're just, this is better. <laughs> it's more better. That's how Lily would say it years ago. It's more better, Papa. Anyway. <laughs> All right. We have to start every time with Luke 16 because most people will approach the Sermon on the Mount as a legalistic type document, something they are trying to attain to. And if you approach it that way, you're going to fail. You're already doomed to failure before you start. All you're doing, if you approach it that way, is you're swapping the Mosaic law for a different law that you couldn't keep the first one. And if you try and keep the second one the same, in the same manner, you're going to, if you couldn't keep the first one and nobody could, you're sure not going to keep the second one. That's why it's called grace. See, the Sermon on the Mount is who you already are. You go, no, I'm not. Now you're arguing with God. Because he says you are this way. Because he said he wrote his law in your mind and in your heart. He took out that old stony heart and he put a new one in you. He put his nature in you. This is really who you are. And it's really almost like this is kingdom living 101. You just got born again yesterday. Here, sit down, Jesus says. Sit down on this this slope going up the mountain. You sit here. I'm going to teach you kingdom principles 101. This is who you are now. Mm. And we get all that from Luke 16, 16. <laughs> That's why we have to start here every time. Because if you don't understand this, you're going to approach it like, you, like everybody does the law. The law of Moses. They just swap one law for another. And you can't keep either one by the energy of the flesh. It's, a, it's supernatural. To walk in the Sermon on the Mount is a supernatural. But you are a supernatural child of a supernatural God. All this is really doing is revealing how much he has already done for each of us. This is who you really are. I hope you can come tonight. I already know what the title is for tonight. Why are you reasoning against what God knows is true? Okay, a little commercial for calling in the lost. Anyway, I'm eager to hear it myself. I already wrote it and I'm eager to hear it. (laughs) Glory to God. All right, Luke 16, 16. The law... Say it with me. The law and the prophets prophets. were until John. Since that time, since I was baptized by John, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. Say it one more time. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. The kingdom of God is preached. Well, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't care how many radical grace preachers say that the red letters, the words of Jesus before the resurrection do not apply to the Christian. They are all liars, every single one of them. 
Because Jesus told them the last thing he said to them before he ascended on high, I want you to go into all the world, and that means even to the Gentiles. See, they'll tell you that their teaching of Jesus was only for the Jews. No, he says, I want you to take, go into all the world now, go into all these Gentile nations, and teach them to observe. That means to do everything I taught you. Everything. everything. Well, Kingdom 101, if he's teaching the kingdom of God now, he's not teaching law. It's like you just got born again yesterday, and he set you down now on this grassy, on this hill, this hillside. It's, thank God it's not like Mount Sinai, where if you touched it, you die. <laughs> well, it's a perfect type of the flesh, though. Now, see, they were flesh creatures, and he, the flesh can't approach God, can't be in God's presence. It'll die. By the way, that's why your flesh still doesn't like praying in tongues. It knows the more you pray in tongues, the more the flesh is going to be mortified. So please, let's go get ice cream. Let's watch a movie. Let's do anything. Well, it, it'll, it'll go to a church. <laughs> it'll do anything before it'll pray. Okay, that's, that's honor to Dave right there. Hallelujah. All right, so let's, go, let's just go ahead and go into Matthew 5 now. I've already got it actually on my page here. Today we're going to... And I, like I say, the farther, the further we get into this, the less review I can do. I just pray you've heard the lessons leading up until this one. And if not, they're at, the, at Dave's website and they're at my website, so you're without excuse. Hallelujah. Not going to stand there on that day and point at me and say he didn't make it available. Yes, we did too. Tim, we're free, aren't we? Hallelujah. It's available. Glory to God. All right. Say, Lord, we did, we did it. Anyway. <laughs> Verse 7, Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, first of all, have you already obtained mercy? Yes. Remember the guy who was justified, you know, the, the Pharisee? He was, he was given all of his reasons why God should bless him. Lord, I fast twice in the week. Lord, I give tithes of all. Lord, I this and Lord, I that. And he, he was trying to justify why God should bless him or answer his prayers or whatever. Jesus turned to that other guy who was a publican. Can I say sinner? <laughs> that guy wouldn't even so much as lift his head toward heaven. He just said, Lord, he'd beat his breast. And he said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's how every one of us got into the kingdom of God. You didn't earn anything from God. God had mercy. I love how Dave would tell us, here man wanted to approach God, and God is across this great gulf, and man has nothing to bargain with, nothing at all to offer. There's nothing he can do. He's, he's totally reprobate. There's nothing in the world he can offer. So God, from his side, crosses that void to our side with his son and sheds his blood so that now we can pick that blood up and we can approach God. And the first way you approach him is with mercy. His mercy is what you need. Now, the thing of it is, in kingdom 101 living, you never want to forget that. You never want to forget that. You're only in the kingdom because of God's mercy toward you. And then for you not to have mercy on others is a violation of the kingdom. That's what he's saying. See, I received mercy. You did too when you got saved. Praise God. In fact, let's, let's look at another verse while we're... Uh, go to Hebrews 4.16. Keep a marker in Matthew 5. We might be back there. I don't know. Hallelujah. Hebrews 4.16. Because it's by grace we're saved. Amen. Well, look at this though. How do you approach the throne of grace? How did you first approach it? Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Well, I want to live right there, don't you? I want to live in that throne of grace. I want, to, I want to be there all the time. But notice, when you come to the throne of grace, when you approach it, the first thing you obtain, notice that we may obtain what? See, mercy. Mercy. You get mercy first. And then... As if mercy wasn't. See, mercy would forgive you, but leave you the same. But God says, no, I don't want to just leave you the same. I'm going to give you my power to help. See, that's grace to help. Say it with me. Grace to help. 
I'm, again, I'm going to, this story is just, it just illustrates it perfect. When I was real young, five or six years old, and I had to be about that age because I know where we were living, and I, me and some friends were playing in the backyard, playing baseball, but we didn't have a baseball at that moment. We had a rock and some sticks, and we were hitting that, you know, one guy was throwing the rock, and the other guy was hitting the stick, and it was my turn at bat, and when I, when I hit that rock with a stick, I, it was a foul ball, and it broke out the neighbor's upstairs window next door. And I'm about five years old. I need mercy. <laughs> now my daddy, my OR carpenter, when he got home and found out what happened, he did not expect me at five years old to get on a 20-foot ladder. Well, first off, go to the, drive to the hardware store, get the materials needed to replace the pane of glass. He did not expect me to do it. What he did was correct me. He didn't spank me because he knew I didn't do it on purpose. But he corrected me and he showed me. He says, now if you, first off, there's a ball in your room. Play with the ball. <laughs> Get, don't be hitting rocks out in the backyard, you know. Get the ball. Play with that. And then he shows, now, if you're going to hit the ball, hit it that way. Okay? In other words, he showed me how not to make that same mistake again. You got that? But then here's, here's the grace to help. See, that's mercy. He had mercy on my ignorance, had mercy on me. But then grace to help, it was my daddy who went to the hardware store. It was my daddy that got out the 20-foot ladder and went up there, took out the old pane, reglazed that window. He said, son, you go and play. I got this. I don't know about you, see. If I, if I could live perfect, if I was living perfect, I would never need mercy. Jesus, I don't think, did. We're pressing towards that mark, but I don't know anybody that's made that mark except him. So not only did I have mercy when I come in the kingdom, I need mercy every day. I need his mercy, and I don't want it's, to... It's what he's saying. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I want mercy, and I want his grace to help. See, he'll fix it when you can't fix it. He'll fix it when you can't fix it. That's his grace to help. And it's not only on those kind of things when you say, I, I just can't stop sinning. Listen, yes, you can. And if you sinned, if you just sinned, you just did it again, when you told God you'd never, and you meant it, but you did it again, don't you run from him. Don't you run from him. When daddy pulls up in the driveway, you run to him. <laughs> I'm remembering. I remember still. He will have mercy on you. And then he'll give you his strength. If you really repent now, you say, I, I don't ever want to do that again. I'm going to give you my strength. I'm going to give you my grace to help in your time of need. And glory to God, we could preach right there for weeks. We are to be imitators of God and extend mercy because He is merciful. And because we are His children, born of His Spirit. Ephesians 4 says we are created in His image. When you get born again, you're created in His image because He is merciful. Therefore, we are merciful. It's really in your nature already. That's what I mean. He's already really made you that way. You're a merciful person, whether you realize it or not. That, that f seed is in you. It is the fruit. What is the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. He is merciful, therefore we are merciful. Now go over to Luke 6. You're going to see the definition of mercy, which we don't like so much. Well, our natural mind doesn't like. Our spirit loves this. His definition of mercy is quite different than ours. Luke 6, and we'll start in verse 27. And actually, so you'll know this is what he's talking about, we're going to go down to verse 36 first. We're going to read the pas I'm going to read the passage of Luke 6, 27 through 36. But look at verse 36 first. Be you therefore. What does the word therefore mean? When you find the word therefore, aren't you supposed to know what it's there for? 
Therefore, in other words, based on everything I just got through saying, be therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. He's really saying you're a chip off the old block. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. This is who he is. When you got born again, this is who you are. This is kingdom living 101. Well, how do I show that mercy? Now you back up to verse 27. Well, I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. What? <laughs> what if he said be merciful to them? Because down at the end he says, therefore, be merciful. Well, he, he's describing here what mercy is. See, it is a good motive to be merciful so that I will obtain mercy, but that's still a very selfish motive. And his love in me, his love in you, is really greater than that. See, you love your enemies because he loves them. And that's the truth. That's really who you are already. Hmm. I say, so what, is, what does he call mercy? Love your enemies. I'll love them from afar. <laughs> well, sometimes you have to. There's a lady that still in this town, my presence does not bless her. I've tried everything I know to do. Angie knows. I've got a witness. I've tried everything I know to do, and my presence still does not bless her. For her, I have to love her from afar. Okay? But normally, that's not how you do it. You do good to them which hate you. You do good to them with hate you. You bless them that curse you. And you pray for them. Now notice which, they don't just use you. <laughs> They're doing it out of spite. They're knowingly doing it on purpose. And what's amazing, that's, that is Christ in you. To pray for them. Even when they do that? Say, Gary, you must be kidding. I'm not like that at all. Yeah, you really are. That's what Jesus is trying to get across to us. Because that's his nature in you. Hmm. Unto him that smiteth thee. Now it's, gone, now it's gone from talk to action. First they were just saying stuff. Now they smited thee. <laughs> And to him that smites thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. Now they're, now they're taking away your stuff. And to him that takes away thy cloak, or thy car, or thy beloved pickup. <laughs> Most of you know the story. <laughs> Forbid not to take thy coat also. Dave would say, if they're going to take away your car, say, just a minute, let me fill it up with gas first. You're going to need a full tank. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, and that means by force, ask them not again. I see so many connections with tonight's service at calling in the lost, but anyway, can't do, can't do them both right now. And as you would that men should do to you, do you also to them likewise? Well, there's the golden rule, isn't it? For if you love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. Now, when he says sinners, he means unborn again people have a natural human love. You got friends. I had friends in the world. Come on. People that I'd take them to dinner. They'd take me to dinner. We'd go to their house and play cards. They'd come to my house and play cards. Whatever, you know. There's a natural human affection even amongst unborn again people. But he says, if you love them that love you, if you do good to them which do good to you, what thing have you? Sinners do that. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give, give you something that will help you all your life. Something... Uh, Jesus taught this. Notice what he just said. Give without expecting it back. Actually, he used the word lend without expecting it back. Now, my mother taught me this in a very practical way many years ago, and it has been a wonderful, wonderful thing. There's many times, my mother and my mom and dad both really were givers, still are. 
And I've tried to be a giver myself. But there's sometimes people won't let you give to them. No, no, I just want to borrow the money. I'm going to pay you back. Sometimes that's the only way you can bless them because they won't let you give it to them. My mom taught me this years ago. Said when that happens, and if you actually lend, like, and it could be a substantial amount, you know, and you lend to them, I don't know, whatever it is. I don't want to say a number because to one person it's high and to another person low. Whatever it is, they want to borrow. And they, but they, they, no, no, I'm going to pay you back. No, let me just give it to you. No, no, I don't want charity. Just let me pay you back. I'm going to pay you back. Okay? And he, he may even work out the terms. I'm going to pay you 100 bucks a month for this many months or whatever it is. When they leave, my mother taught me, the moment they leave, you gave that to them. And I mean, in your heart, you gave it to them. If you ever see a penny of it back, that's a bonus. I, I'm t I have lived on both sides of that. In my young, young, young days, I did not live that way. And I learned it caused, if they didn't pay it back, how many of you know not everybody pays it back? <laughs> Even when they intended to, I'm just saying. And when those early days before I learned this, it would cause, well, what's wrong with them? Maybe it would just cause things, you know, and there's, yeah, I, can, yeah, I would have to say a root of something. I hate to say bitterness. <laughs> Unfree, I hate to say that, but that's really what it is. But once my mama got it across to me and I started doing that, oh, there is freedom in this place. <laughs> I mean, that has been one of the best things in my life. Just let it go. You have a provider. Oh, I hope you come to calling in the lost tonight. Anyway, so much. <laughs> Hallelujah. But if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive what thank you, sinners do that. Verse 35. Here he sums up everything he's been saying. But love you, your enemies. And do good. And lend. Notice, hoping for nothing again. Let me just say, you have a provider. They are not your provider. When we really get this, what he's teaching here, because he continues in Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God. See, this is seeking for who you seeking here. You're seeking that enemy. You're seeking that lost one for the kingdom. You're, doing, you're living like Jesus. Actually, you're letting Jesus live through you towards them. And they're the ones God's after. You're seeking first the kingdom and God's promise. I don't care if they, this is really Luke 6, 38. They may take away your goods. They may slap you on the face. They may take everything. They may take your car. Just let it go. Because as long as you extend God's mercy and his grace to them, the sinner, God says, I will get it back to you some other way. Press down, shaking together and running over. Will men give into your bosom? You will not be permanently diminished for extending my mercy and my grace to the sinner. Glory to God. You have a provider. Hallelujah. So love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing. Again, now all of this to me, because he says, therefore, therefore, all of this is describing mercy. This is how you literally live mercy. All of these things. See, be merciful. There's no such thing. The definition of mercy is because they did it. <laughs> it's easy to, how do you show mercy to somebody who never did nothing to you? There's no such thing as that. That's not mercy. Mercy's when they did it. And this is how you respond. <laughs> There's actually people here. I'm getting a few quiet amens around the room. Now, see, there they are. I told you they're here. Let me read that verse again, see. Love ye your enemies. Do good, lend, hoping for nothing again. Your reward shall be great. Your reward shall be great. And you shall be the children of the highest. This is how he is. This is who you are. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. And he sums it up. Be you, therefore, merciful, even as your Father also is merciful. Now, particularly notice in verses 27 and verse 35, the word love. 
And let me just tell you. The Sermon on the Mount is taking the law from being external to the law of love being internal. Under the law, maybe you were merciful, but in your heart, you hated that guy. I'm having some of that right now with some of our political people. I'll just be honest with you, okay? I'm having to pray for people that I don't want to. <laughs> but I really do want to because God is trying to reach those very people. See, and this is helping me. This is really helping me. I hope it's helping you. Because God's moving everything from external to internal. See? From, from his point of view, I'm just, there is no mercy without love, really. Just legalistic mercy. That's not what he's after. That may be where you start. I'm just kind of starting there. I'm, I already told him, I said, I'm going to challenge you to put your love in me for that one person that I'm thinking of right now. I'm not going to tell you who it is. There's more than one of them. <laughs> I said, this will, be a, this will be a miracle akin, akin to splitting the Red Sea. If I wake up one morning and there's genuine love in my heart for that person. But I believe you can do it. Yeah. You want to know what I heard? I've already done it. I heard it as clear as you're hearing my voice. Problem is, it's still such a tiny seed. I can't taste the fruit of it. But it does not mean it's not in there. It is in there. See, that's the whole lesson. That's what, that's what this lesson is. It is in there. His love for that person is in me. Okay. Now you're going to find also there's no such thing as mercy without forgiveness. How do you have mercy without forgiving? You can't do it. Love, forgiveness, and mercy are all very closely related. Let me say it a few different ways. We love as we are loved. Didn't that make sense? Aren't we to love as we are loved? We forgive as we have been forgiven. But we have mercy. We show mercy as we have been shown mercy. I don't know about you. See, some people, I, I listen to Bronx testimony. Got the most boring testimony on earth. I love Bronx. If you're listening, I love you, man. He says, well, I got saved and filled as a little child, never really rebelled against God, served God my whole life. <laughs> Boring. I, <laughs> how do I relate with that? Because Sue and I, testimony is a little different from that. You know? <laughs> I mean, for us, when we... For me, I'll just talk for me. Sue can give her own testimony. For me, it was like when I really, when I got saved, it was like Gary was, I, I was being held out like a, what do you call it, a hot dog on a stick, <laughs> right over the flames of hell. I mean, if anybody deserves hell, it's Gary. And I knew I was going there. And he still had mercy on me still had mercy on me and I'm not going to show mercy and I'll tell you this the, there's a the, mm, I started to say the few times that I've not and he's correcting me there's been many times when I've not shown mercy but the few that I'm really thinking of right now I'm still recovering see you can he'll forgive you in a heartbeat but you can do damage to people it's like the murderer. He'll forgive you for murder. That person is still dead. There's still consequences. I'm just telling you from experience and also from the word, you're much better off to live this way. Show mercy. Don't, don't have regret for the times that you didn't. He's forgiven me. I understand that. Don't write me no letters. I know that. But I hurt people. And they're still not 100% recovered. I pray they will be. He'll probably have to use somebody else. Anyway. What I mean by that is I've, yeah, I've tried every approach I can think of and I can't approach it. There's no avenue. He'll, but he'll still do it. 
Say it with me. God is, big, God is smarter than I am dumb. I don't make any mistakes that His grace is not big enough to fix. He can repaint all my broken windows. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm saying. See, this all, this all has to do how we are to live as children of light, children of light on planet earth. You stop demonstrating love and forgiveness and mercy when you forget who you are as a child of light. And you forget that you're living here really on just a temporary loan to serve in the kingdom. And to live for his kingdom. That's really what the sermon. The whole ser all chapters 5, 6, and 7. The whole thing is about seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Live as though you're truly a child of God. Live every day for the kingdom. And all, everything else. He'll take care of it. Hmm. So you don't ever want to forget who you are. As a child of God. Where you're from. Your citizenship is not even of this planet. Your citizenship is in heaven. And why you're here. You're here to let the king live through you. Okay. All right. We already did that. Hallelujah. And I'll go ahead and say this. I get, I get a little persecution still sometimes when I, when I say this. But I'm going to keep saying it anyway. Yes, sir. Okay. Wasn't going to do that. Go to Matthew 18. Because people, they have a hard time with this. So here's what I was going to say. Every time I teach this, I say this. I say the most miserable people that I have ever met on, this, on my journey are Christians who refuse to forgive. They are the most torment, tormented people. And I'll tell you right now, the radical grace preachers have even taken that away. They say you don't even really have to forgive. I'm telling you, it's, it's just, uh, it's not good. <laughs> they live in daily torment. See, we'll just read uh, Matthew 18. I'm just going to read the parable, but you, I'm, going, I'm going to read the whole thing. Because I'm... Uh, I'm starting verse 21, but it's hard to start with the word then. <laughs> so let's back up to 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. So we're talking trespass. We're talking there's an issue. Unforgiveness is possible. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. And in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen and a publican. Now, I, I remember Pastor Dave saying, aha, finally. Now I can treat this guy as a heathen and a publican. I got lawyers who have lawyers. I'm going to sue his Bitches off that. You know, David, do it really good, you know. <laughs> Trouble is that Jesus hadn't finished teaching yet. <laughs> He's teaching about being reconciled. See, how do we, what did we just get through reading? How are we supposed to treat those who are heathens and publicans to us? Do good to them, pray for them, give to them, help them. Love them. Isn't that what we just read? Well, that's a little different than I'm going to sue your britches off. <laughs> so verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth. Now if you underline, please underline loose. Whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay? And you'll see here from the parable that loosing is when you forgive them. You loose them. Let, so God can go after them with all the resources of heaven. You, if it, the unforgiveness binds them, you're binding them to your, to your bad part of self-flesh. <laughs> 
You're, buying, you're thinking like a human, like you're, you're thinking like an, uh, an unborn again person. Hmm. Okay. Verse 19, again I say unto you that if, now see, this verse it's taken out of context all the time. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Doug, I agree with you right now that you and I both will have three pink, purple, and striped Cadillacs by the end of the day. Are we in agreement? Glory to God. Think that's what he's talking about? Not on your best day. <laughs> that Doug says, yeah, we'll just keep that. <laughs> No, it's those two witnesses you took with you. It's the ones that, that this whole argument, they've been with you from the beginning. If you guys all agree, we're going to forgive this guy. We're going to, lose, we're going to let God deal with this guy. <laughs> we're going to lose him. I forgive you. Now, you'll see it here. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. What he's still talking about, those, the guys you took with you that heard the whole thing, come in agreement, loose this guy and let him go. Now, Peter understood it. He knew what Jesus was talking about. Look at verse 21. So then came Peter to him and said, Well, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Peter understood it. He knew what Jesus was saying. Loose him and let him go. Forgive him. Well, how often do I do that? And I know, I know Peter thought he was being generous. Don't you know it? Till seven times? I mean, man. And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now if the Lord is saying, if he's saying we should forgive seventy times seven, why do you reckon there's an, do you think there's an end to his mercy? My Bible says his mercies are new every morning. Okay, we'll get there in a minute. Now this tormenting thing, so, so cause you, I'm telling you, there's people that the only reason they're in the kingdom is the mercy and the forgiveness of God through the blood of Jesus. We're all in the kingdom that way, but they forget that. Somebody does something to them and they hold a grudge. They will not forgive. They will not let it go. So he gives this parable. I'm going to go through it fairly quick. We've taught on this many times. Verse 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven. This is how you operate in the kingdom. This is the kingdom of heaven. He's teaching. He's not teaching law here. He's teaching principles of the kingdom. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. If you work that out in modern money, it's just an astronomical sum. It's like the national debt. It's a bunch. You never have a chance of paying that. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold. Now notice, and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. That's called unforgiveness. <laughs> right? And the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Oh, verse 27. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with what? Compassion. What are we supposed to do to our enemies? Love your enemies. The Lord, compassion is love in action. The Lord was moved with compassion. I told you, I asked you to underline that word loosed above. He was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. And that's what happened when you got saved. You had a sin nature. You had a debt that could not be paid. You had no way, nothing to offer you. A lifetime of good works could not change your nature. There was nothing, 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 nothing that you could offer. But God sent Jesus paid your debt with his blood and loosed you so you can go free. Glory to God. Gary was the sin hot dog on a stick. <laughs> right out over the flames of hell. I could smell the sulfur, honey. I'm telling you. <laughs> he loosed me. Jesus came, paid the price for Gary. He said, you let him go. I forgive him. You let him go. He extended mercy to me. And he did to you too. 
And we better be showing that mercy to others because that's really who we are. But there are Christians who don't get it. They just haven't been taught. Really, they don't know who they are. They don't understand these very things that we're talking about in these lessons because they've not been. The Sermon on the Mount has not been taught hardly to very many people. We don't understand it. And so they're, they're just reacting like a normal human when they're not a normal human. See? No, 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 it's wrong. I won't forgive. I won't forgive. Well, he, tells, he, he talks about that. Verse 28. But the same servant, the one that was forgiven, a debt. This guy owed the national debt trillions. <laughs> no chance he could ever pay it. And the king paid it for him. It just loosed him and let him go. And that same servant, he went out and he found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and that's like nothing. Lunch money. <laughs> just nothing. But he laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, And notice it's the same words. Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not. But went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. And they came and told unto their Lord, that's the king, all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant. Boy, I don't ever want to hear that. I don't ever, ever, ever want to hear that from Jesus. O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desired me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant? Even as I had pity on thee. In other words, what we just read, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you. Everything that he just said, shouldn't you do the same to them that I did with you? Verse 34. And his Lord was wroth. That means really mad. Delivered him to the tormentors. Till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you. And boy if you underline. If you from your hearts. From your heart. I'm telling you the kingdom of God. Is moving everything from external to internal. From your hearts forgive not every one of his brother. Their trespasses. Many people preach right there that they go to hell. I don't, I don't think that's what he's talking about. I don't think your unforgiveness is necessarily bigger than the blood of Jesus. But I'm going to, stick, go, I'm going to circle back around to my statement. Because I've seen it too many times. Christians. The Christians that I have known. Now we're not talking about tormented in the world. I'm talking about Christians. Christians. That refuse to forgive others. And sometimes it's terrible, terrible things that was done to them. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's lunch money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sometimes it's a little thing. But sometimes it's not. The ones that refuse to forgive. That refuse to show mercy. They're tormented. They live in torment all the time. Very often that torment manifests in physical things. Okay? Not always. But they're just... There's no peace. There's very little joy. They just live in torment. Trust me when I say. See, if I hadn't have listened to my mama about, let's just take the money thing. If I hadn't listened to her, if I went, I don't even have a memory in me of people. I, I, I would have to go back somehow through my old checkbook or something because I don't even remember. But I know there has been cases where people have borrowed money and not paid it back. But I listened to my mama. <laughs> And I, there's no reckoning in me. There is no account. I forgave them the day. I mean, I gave it to them the day they walked out the door with it. See? But if I hadn't have done that, 10 years go by, 15 years go by, and that's festering on the inside of me. Man, don't tell me it wouldn't affect me when I saw them. It would too. Well, that's just when it comes to money. What if it was other things that needed to be forgiven? 
Hallelujah. Dave taught us the difference between mercy and grace. When you can't improve on it, you just steal Dave's stuff, right? <laughs> he stole it from Paul. Anyway, <laughs> we're all plagiarizing Paul, aren't we, Dave? <laughs> He's going, mm -hmm. okay. See, Dave taught us, here's mercy. You come home, you catch the guy in the act. He's lit, the thief is literally carrying your TV out the side door. <laughs> you caught him right in the act. You pull out your 38 Smith and Wesson. <laughs> you caught him. I caught you. And the guy begins to say to you, please, mister. He says, I'm, I'm a father. I've got little kids at, at home that are hungry. I, I'm unemployed. He starts giving you all the reasons like they always do, you know. And uh, please have mercy on me. Please have mercy. Well, mercy would be, okay, put my TV back. I'm going, mercy would say, I'm going to let you go. And I'm not going to press charges. That's mercy. That's the first thing you get when you come to the throne of grace, that you might obtain mercy. But then Dave would say, grace now. Grace would say to that same thief, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to extend grace to you. I'm going to adopt you into my family. I'm going to literally, legally adopt you. You're going to become my son. I'm going to give you my name, and I'm going to give you an inheritance from my own reserves. And that is what God has done for us. Thank God for his mercy, but I even more thank God for his grace. I'm not just an old sinner saved by grace. He has birthed me into his family I have literally been born of God. He had literally not only adopted me, but literally made me his child. I'm an offspring of the Spirit of God. And I, he's given me an inheritance in the name of Jesus that I could never exhaust in a thousand eternities if there was such a thing. Oh, my Lord. Grace to help. Mm. I just gave you some... You can just write these down. I've already got them printed out on my page. I looked up the word tender mercies. I like mercy. I like tender mercies better. <laughs> now these aren't all of them. But these are, these are just, if you see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Just seven that I copied. These are from the Psalms. Psalm, you can write it down. Psalms 25, 6. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies. And thy loving kindness. For they have been ever of old. See God doesn't change. Psalms 40 verse 11. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me. O Lord. Let thy loving kindness. And thy truth. Continually preserve me. This one, let's turn to this one. Psalms 51. The reason this one is so important, they're all important. But the reason I want to particularly focus on this one, when you've really done it bad, even you know you need mercy. <laughs> well, this is about as bad as it gets. It says here in the little introduction to this psalm in my Bible, a psalm of David... When Nathan the prophet, now that's not our Nathan, that's Old Testament Nathan. <laughs> when Nathan the prophet came unto him, after he had gone into Bathsheba. We're talking adultery here. We're talking worse than that because really, he not only went into Bathsheba, and we're adults here, you know what that means. He also had her husband killed. Uriah. I mean, it's murder. Smooth out. He didn't, he didn't literally, as we would say, pull the trigger. But he concocted a battle plan that would for sure get Uriah killed. And it did get him killed. Now, here is a man guilty of murder and adultery. And he had not repented. He didn't even see it until Nathan the prophet came and opened his eyes to it. But now he sees it. This is David's response to God. You want to see repentance? Watch this. 
And notice the first word. When you're guilty, this is a great, great first word. Have mercy. <laughs> Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. Now this is, here's a murderer and an adultery. Adultery? Adultery -er. No, a murderer and an adulterer. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude, here it is, of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. That's what happened when you got saved. And that's what happens every time you go to 1 John 1.9. Where the blood of Jesus is still on the mercy seat. And I don't care how bad you did it. Blot out my transgressions. That's what 1 John 1, 9. He'll not only forgive you. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's when you leave that mercy seat. It's as though you never sinned. There is no stain of the flesh. Showing through your garment of righteousness. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. 1 John 1, 9. For I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. This is heartfelt sorrow. It took Nathan the prophet to open up David's eyes to his own sin. But boy, once he sees it. That's why it's good to come. Sometime you'll come to a service. Okay, good. You, maybe you haven't murdered anybody. Maybe you haven't adulterated anybody. <laughs> but you've done something that you're, you're oblivious to. You didn't even realize. And then that, that's the service where somehow the Spirit of God will show you. Boy, I've been in those. <laughs> and there's no point in saying you didn't do it when you did do it. He already knows anyhow. You, do you know God wasn't surprised when Dave acknowledged David? Had, he was surprised maybe that David acknowledged it, but it wasn't a surprise to God. What? You committed adultery? When? <laughs> he already knows. That's the thing. Why run from him? He already knows. Run to him. Mm. For I acknowledge my transgressions, my sin is ever before thee. Now notice, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Hmm. And done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest. And be clear when thou judgest. And he goes on to say. So we were all like this too. Behold I was shapen in iniquity. We were all born sinners. Come on. How many of you know you're not a sinner anymore? See we have something David never had. But I still need mercy if I miss it. Don't you? All right. All right. I think that he wants to. He's going. Finish these other verses. Yes, sir. <laughs> you can do a big study. It was a lot. Um, Psalms 51, you could, you could teach a seminar just on that one psalm. Now, Psalm 69, 16. We're still looking at tender mercies. Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Psalm 79, verse 8. All of these are 1 John 1, 9 worthy. <laughs> Listen to this one. First, Psalm 79, verse 8. Oh, remember not against us former iniquities. Let thy tender mercies speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. How did uh, Paul say that? Forgetting those things that are past. Well, you can only forget them after you've been cleansed of them by going to 1 John 1, 9. Every t I didn't look this verse up, but he, at one point Paul, near the end of his life, says, I am, I am free from the guilt of the blood of all men. Something, a statement like that. Isn't that right? And every time I read that, I went, would Stephen agree? What about the other ones that Paul had letters and they brought them back and arrested them and stoned them to death? Would they agree? Well, I know Stephen would, because Stephen, right before he went into heaven, he said, Lord, lay not this iniquity to their charge. There's the love of God. There's, 
There's Luke 6, verse 27, 28, 29. Love your enemies. Pray for them. You talk about despitefully using you when they're stoning you to death. It doesn't get a lot more despiteful than that. Lay not this iniquity to their charge. Mm. It was so in Paul that he could stand up and say, I am free from the guilt of the blood of all men. Forgetting those things that are past. If, it's, if the blood has washed it away, bless the Lord God, it is washed away. Now you go have mercy on others. Same way he had mercy on you. That's kingdom living 101. All right, and then Psalms 145.9, we'll finish with this one. The Lord is good to the good. Do you all think that's what it says? It's not. It says the Lord is good to all. See, that's what Jesus said. We just read it a while ago. He says... Love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. Your reward shall be great. You shall be the children of the highest. Now get this. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Here he says, the Lord is good to all. And his tender mercies, tender mercies, tender mercies are over all his works. Say it with me. I am merciful. As my heavenly Father is merciful. I am always merciful to others. So that I always walk in mercy from my Father. Not only do I have mercy. But I have found his grace to help. In my time of need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.